Anyway, good to see you guys. Uh, how are you today? Good. Someone was going, is this group always this rowdy? You say, yeah, the caffeine has gotten into your system by the time you get here, right? I'll tell you what, 6 o'clock service, you talk about rowdy, that group, man, they are crazy. I, I, I mean, they'll boo me there, they'll laugh, they'll jeer, they'll cheer, everything. I mean, it is like they are so off the chain there, and you guys are a close second, so it's kind of fun. <laughs> kind of, yeah, just to egg you on, right? Um, Hey, good to be here uh, with you guys. My name is Mark. For those of you that it is your first time here and just want to welcome you uh, to the bridge, we never take lightly the fact that it's kind of uh, sometimes a little nerve-wracking to even go to another church, and you never know what you're going to get and what you're going to encounter, and we're just uh, thankful that you chose to spend uh, this time with us today. Um, got a question for you guys. How many of you are at a point of of you're either at a point of transition or you're looking to transition or something's going on where you just feel like something needs to change. There's kind of this something, a discontentment, something that's stirring inside of you. Maybe you can't quite put your finger on it. Maybe it has to do with relationships. Maybe it has to do with finances. Maybe it has to do with your business, uh, your career, how you handle it. It has to do with the, the, your school, something is stirring inside of you where you just feel like there's, there, there's got to be something more to this. There, there's something, you just feel like there's a stirring uh, in that area of your life. How many of you are experiencing something like that right now? Okay, that, that, that's good. How many of you, even before I said that, you came in here with that? Like you, you walked in the room and you had that, okay, all right, that's cool, that's cool. It's important that you pay close attention to that. It's important that you pay attention to what is going on inside of your gut when that is happening. It's important that, that you are aware and in tune because when God is stirring inside of you, when, when there's something happening inside of you, that's often the opportunity when God is about to do something. And, and what God is always doing is he's looking for people who are aware and are in tune with that, and they're willing to begin to ask him for things that nobody ask, is asking him for. They're willing to believe him for something that nobody else will believe him for. They're willing to see things in a way that nobody else is wanting to see. When you're, when you're experiencing that, when you're experiencing that, that there's got to be more, there's got to be more, it's so important that you pay attention to what's going on inside of you and that you do not ignore that. Because that's really the beginning of where dreams happen. That's, that's where it starts. And, and today I want to talk with you about making your, your dreams a reality. We're kicking off a new series called Step Up, and I think of it it's in terms of step up and be fearless. And if there's anything that, that I want for you over this next month, this next series of messages that we're going to do over the next few weeks, it's I want you to open up your life to something that God wants to do that takes you beyond where you are. I want you to open up your life and allow God to put something in you that is going to take you to a whole different place with him. I, I want you to open up your life that way. I want you to be willing to step up and be fearless. I want you to be willing to go maybe where you haven't gone before, to do what you haven't done before. I want you to be willing to just open your life so wide open to God that everything that lives inside of you says, God, whatever happens, I do not want to miss it. Because I believe that's exactly what God wants for you. And today I want to begin to press into this. And over the next month, we're going to be, it's, this is about vision. This is about who we are. This is about what God wants to do in you, what God wants to do in us. And I just want you to keep your heart open. There was a young man, the scriptures tell, tell us about, his name was Jabez, a very unfortunate name, quite frankly. His name was Jabez because his mother experienced so much pain when she gave him birth that she basically named him, you're a pain. That's it. You're a pain. His name means pain. You're a pain. That's what his name means. He grew up cursed with that name. Now, when I was little, my mom used to warn me when I was getting on her nerves, I'm going to call the pest control on you. 
I literally, when she would tell me that, I pictured a guy coming to the door with a fogger with a tank on it, you know, like you saw in the cartoons, and that he was going to come in the house and chase me around and try to gas me. That's what I used to think. It was like, used to freak me out when she'd say, I'm going to call the pest control on you. Now, how many of you know that if my mom continued to call me pest, I would have become even better at it, right? If you, if you, if you, if you tell a kid you're never going to amount to anything, You'll never be any good. How many of you know that a child will absolutely fulfill that? Not only will they fulfill it, they will become creative at finding new ways to do it. And here this young man grew up with his mom basically looking at him and saying, you're a pain. That's your name. It's who you are. You're just one big pain. And this guy is willing to ask God for something that nobody else is asking for. He's willing to see in a way that nobody else wants to see. He's willing to believe in a way that nobody else seems to be believing. And so in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, starting in verse 9, take a look at what it says. It says, there was a man named Jabez who was more honorable, say more honorable, more honorable than any of his brothers. His mother named him Jabez because his, his birth had been so painful. He was the one who prayed to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. And God granted him his request. Now, the interesting thing is, is the writer of Chronicles says, hey, this is the one. He's the one you heard about. He's the one we know about. This is the guy you've heard the story. So apparently, when this is being written, people already knew the story. They might not have known his name, but they're like, did you hear about the guy that, that came from this background? And did you hear what God did in his life? He was the one. This guy, his name is Jabez. That's his name. And, and from his life, there are four things that I can tell you you are going to face as, as you pursue the dream that God has for you. And by the way, when I talk about having a dream, you know, the problem is so many times we look at a dream as anything that's not where I am now. It stinks right now. I don't like the way things are. And so any dream will do as long as I get to be somewhere else than where I am. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about an escape. I'm not talking about just a change of scenery that you're going to move to another town because you think things are going to be different there. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something deeper than that. And we're talking about a space where you can go and where it is something that God puts inside of you. Here's the first thing. Here's the first thing that I can tell you. That if you're going to make your dreams a reality, then number one, you've got to press into God's presence. You, you, you have got to press into God's presence. Now, I know that that sounds like a very religious phrase. To some of you, it might even sound like a cliche. You might be coming out of circles where, oh, yeah, they talk about that stuff all the time. Here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a space where you are hearing God. I'm talking about that space where you get down to the gut level of what's living inside of you, and you have it out with God. You are honest. You lay it all on a line. You're talking from your gut that you're in that space where you're all ears. I'm not talking about just saying wishes into the air. But I'm talking about that you move into a space where you're pressing in to the sense of God being there, you being there with him, and you're just wanting to hear and that you're staying there. This is a, a pattern of I've got to hear from God, that you press into the presence of God, and it's going to be so important that you do that because when you get into the presence of God, he's able to filter through your system, hey, you're just trying to escape. You need to deal with something here. We're not going to, we don't have a dream right now. Right now, you got to take care of business. God will filter that out. He'll reveal it to you. But then there's that space where God tattoos something on your heart, a dream, a sense of destiny. And he tattoos it on your heart in such a way that you know God did it. And it's not like you chose it, it chose you. It's like that business, it's like that, 
that ministry. It's like that thing that you pursued because you knew that this is something that I absolutely must do, and if I don't, I'm going to spend the rest of my life regretting it. That if I don't step out, if I don't step up, if I don't step up to be fearless, then I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. There is something that happens when you press into the presence of God that doesn't happen any other way. It's not like an Amway meeting. It's not like a rah, 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 let's go and take on the world. It's not like that. It is something that it is you and it is God. And he writes it and he tattoos it on your heart and it's so important. Let me tell you, it's going to be so important because any dream that is worth pursuing, any dream that God writes in your heart, you're going to face opposition to that dream. Things are going to get hard. When you pursue that, it's going to be hard. And if, and if it's not a dream that God put on your heart and if it's one of those, hey, I think I'll try this, if it's one of those, oh, it's got to be for me because I hate where I'm at. If it's one of those things, I guarantee you when things get hard, you'll walk away from it. Guess I was wrong. Guess I didn't have that one right. But when God tattoos something on your heart, something to ask him for, some place where he wants to take you, then it's not just a dream. It becomes a sense of destiny that lives inside of you, and nothing that you go through will ever take that out of your heart because God has tattooed it. I can remember when, when uh, before uh, we got married, when I got on my knees, I can remember exactly where it was, and I asked God, is Maria the one you want me to marry? And I remember exactly what God put on my heart in terms of who to talk to and talking to that person. They said, well, obviously, it's so clear to me. And, and I took that as a confirmation. And, and so we got married. And, and when we went through hardships, and then the thoughts started coming through my head, you married the wrong person. You married the wrong person. That was a big, this is a big mistake. You need to get out of this thing. When those thoughts would come through, what happened was there was a different voice that would override all that and go, you remember when I told you to, what, how I answered your prayer? Do you remember who I told you to talk to, to talk to? Do you remember how I spoke through them and you got your confirmation? And once that would settle upon my heart, because it was already tattooed there, I'd go, okay, God, that this is part of the process of learning how to love. When, when, when uh, the time came to, to look at the opportunity to, to be a pastor, and this was like my, this is my first rodeo, okay? Never did this before. And when the search committee was gathered together and they were praying and God downloaded to one of the people on the search team that I will confirm who's supposed to be the pastor with 13 votes against him. And he shared it with the rest of the team. And the day came, and I preached, and we went in the back, and we're waiting for the vote. And a guy comes back, and he's got tears running down his, his face. And he looks at the other guy on the team, and he says, how many votes no did God tell you? He said, 13. He threw the paper on the table, and he said, 13, no votes. And there were so many times in this journey that I wanted to quit. Matter of fact, if you ask most pastors, do you ever feel like quitting? You know what they say? Every Monday. So many mistakes I've made, so many relationships I've had to say goodbye to, so much pain in the journey, so many times. I can remember, I can remember actually complaining to God, and I, this is a picture that came to my mind. I felt like a 14-year-old, and God handed me the keys to a Greyhound bus that was full of people, and he said, now you drive. I can remember saying, did you, I said this, did you know what the heck you were doing when you put me in this? Did you know what you were doing? Because I can't take the pain. I want to I quit. And what God would bring me back to is, you remember those 13 no votes? I did that so you would never, ever give up. And it was in the presence of God that God tattoos on your heart not just a dream, but a sense of destiny. And you know that he's done it because you don't feel like you chose it. You feel like it chose you. You feel like this is something that that's God is giving me, calling me to. This is a, a calling. It's not just a business. It's not just a, a ministry. It's not just something I'm doing. It's not, it's, it, it, it's, it's, if I don't do this, I'll look back at the rest of my life and regret it. 
And, and God will, will take you there like it took Jabez and was able to inscribe on Jabez's heart something that mattered because he was so willing to press into the presence of God. If you have tried to run a business, if you started a business from scratch, if you run a department, if you carry the burden of people underneath you, you carry that in a way that nobody else can even begin to appreciate. And it's in that place, when you get into the presence of God, that God is able to speak to you and help you to see a bigger picture, the destiny for what he's created you for and the context to carry that out. So the first thing is, is you've got to press into God's presence. Your dream is too small. Your dream on your own. If you say, hey, God, I got this great idea, and I'm going to hitch this idea onto you, now you pull, God's going to rip the hitch off. He's going to put the pedal to the metal and it's not going to go anywhere because he'll already be far ahead waiting for you to finally get with what he wants to do in your life. You've got to get to where God is able to say, this is why I created you. This is what you're on earth for. This is your purpose. Here's what I want to do uniquely through you that I'm not choosing anybody else for. And when you feel that discontentment, when you feel that stirring, I'm telling you, you're in a place where you've got to get into God's presence. You've got to press in and you've got to stay there. Second thing is this, don't be afraid to dream. If you're going to make your dream a reality, don't be afraid to dream. His name was Jabez. He'd been told you're a pain his whole life. He lived with that. You know, it became a theme, and, and we, we have to be careful because oftentimes there's themes that we carry in our lives, and it's based on what other people have said. And oftentimes, let's face it, there's very good reason why we have the theme. We've done plenty of things to deserve it. Let's own it. But that theme is sometimes becomes the place where you stop dreaming because you go, this is me. It's the way I'm always going to be. But Jabez was willing to say, God, I want something different. I don't want to just be the pain. God, I believe. I believe I believe for something greater that you can do in my life. And because he was willing to go to God and ask this, the scripture says that he was more honorable than any of his brothers because he was asking what nobody else was asking for. He was believing something that nobody else was believing. And now he's willing to see what nobody else would see. And he's letting go of the theme of his life. He's not holding on to it anymore. He, he's, he's not afraid to dream anymore. This is so big, you guys, because his mom called him pain, but God called him more honorable. I can tell you that no matter what you've done in your past, no matter what labels you've earned, no matter what, what identities that have been assigned to you, no matter what low expectations follow you around, I can tell you this, that though people may see you that way, that God says you could be more honorable. That God says you can be different for you. If there's anything that we learn from the cross and Jesus Christ, it's this. Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins, our mistakes, our failures. And for the person who says, I believe in you, you're my Savior, the Scriptures tell us that you become crucified at that moment. That literally, God puts you to death. The old you, with all the labels, with all the wrong identities, with all the you're just a pain, all that stuff, God puts it to death, and he forgives you of all of it. And just as God raised Jesus from the dead, God raises you to live a whole new life. A whole new life. And you may think, you may think, oh, you don't understand, you don't know my past, and I can tell you something. It doesn't matter that I know your past. God knows your past. He forgives it. He's the one that gives you his power. He's the one that raises you to a new life. He's the one that gives you the ability to dream a new dream, and you can't be afraid to go there. You can't say, I don't deserve it. Look at my past. You've got to say, I believe it. I believe in what you do. I believe in who you are. And even if nobody else around you believes in you and believes what God can do in you, you've got to let that go. And you've got to believe what nobody else will believe. You've got to be more honorable than the people around you. Don't ever be afraid to dream. Don't allow a theme to keep you trapped. You, you break that. You, you dream. You dream. Now, some of you have stopped dreaming a long time ago. 
For some of you, you're like, oh, I'm too old for a dream. I'm too old for God to do something through me. Listen, you're wrong. If you have breath, God is not done doing something in your life. You have the ability to do something and to bring something and contribute something that other people need. But you've got to start to open up your heart to a dream. And you've got to press into the presence of God and say, God, I'm not stopping. You show me. You show me what you want me to do, who you want me to be. I don't want to be afraid to dream anymore. Here's the third thing. This is huge. You've got to begin to take responsibility. You've got that. Nobody's going to dream your dream for you. Nobody's going to make it happen for you. If you're waiting for it to fall out of the sky, you've got a long wait coming. Ladies, stop waiting for the white knight on his galloping horse to come and make your dreams come true. You let God give you your dream and your sense of destiny. And when you find a guy who also has a sense of destiny and he's able to bless what God is calling in your life, then you marry that guy. You don't marry a guy who's not willing to bless what God is doing in your life. You stay away from that. Guys, stop waiting for your dad to tell you he's proud of you. If he hasn't woken up and told you by now, then you got to hear it from your father in heaven because he's got a destiny for you. You've got to begin to take responsibility for this. You cannot allow it to just lay there. I love what he says. He says, he says, God, he says, oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do. Be with me in all that I do. He didn't say, God, do it for me. God, sprinkle magic dust on my life. He said, you know what I want, God? I know I cannot walk this out if you're not with me, and I want you to be with me in everything I do. That means, God, I want my life, I want to live my life in a way that just continually attracts your presence and your activity. God, I just want to live my life that way. I just always want you to be in this with me. I want to be with you. God, this is the way I want to do it. I'm going to take responsibility to cooperate with your destiny for me. And you've got to do the same. Because if you're stuck in that place, he, here's what he could have done. Oh, I'd like to believe that, God, but I'm a pain. I've been told I'm a pain. My mother, man, if you could see my parents, if you saw the way I was raised. Blah, blah, blah. When you blame, you're giving away your power. When you, take your, when you take responsibility, you are claiming power. What you're saying is, no more will I allow my life to be defined by the opinions of other people. I no longer will I allow the judgments of other people because of my failures define me. I will not do that. I will take responsibility. God, I want to do this with you. I'm not asking you to do it for me. I'm asking to do it with you. I want to do this together. You know why God wants to do that? Because he's a God of relationship. That's why. And he doesn't want to do it any other way than with you. He wants to go with you. He wants you to begin to take responsibility. You know, there are things that you can definitely take responsibility for. And Jabez, given the bitterness of his upbringing, given the, the pain of his upbringing, what he took responsibility for was his attitude. And he could have dishonored his mom. But you know that dishonor will never lead you to God's plan for you. Dishonor and blame will always push you farther off course. But when you forgive and you begin to trust God, when you begin to take responsibility, now you're ready to go. That's the path that God wants to move you down, that path of honor. You know, sometimes we just cry out and we go, God, I cannot do this without you. You're right. He wants to go with you. It's the only way that he wants to do it. But you've got to take responsibility and choose what you're going to be about. You've got to be able to say, God, I want you to be with me in all that I do. I don't want to go if you're not in it. I don't want to go if you're not doing this. I only want to go with you, and I don't want to go any other way. Look what he goes on to say. Taking responsibility, he says, keep me from trouble. 
Keep me from trouble. Now, when you read it, it says there, he says, Oh, that you would bless me, expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. Now, it's not what you think it says. What, when you read that, you, it looks like he's wishing for a life that is free from any struggle. How many of you know that is like a fantasy, right? That's not even a, that's not a dream. That's, that's pure fantasy. I mean, you got to be smoking strong stuff to believe that one, right? <laughs> Doesn't happen. If you look at the New King James Version, it actually has, I think, the better translation for that. And this is the translation. Keep me from trouble that I might not cause pain. And see, what he's saying is this. Up to this point, I've been called a pain. I want to be the opposite, God. Up to this point, I've been, been seen as the problem. I don't want to be that anymore, God. And, and the very thing that he had inherited, the same cycles of dysfunction that get passed down from generation to generation, at some point, someone wakes up and understands that God has something better for them. At some point, someone wakes up and goes, the cycle stops here with me, God. It doesn't get past me. Keep me from trouble. Because I don't want to cause the same kind of pain in the lives of other people that I've experienced. Because I believe, God, that you've got something better. And I believe, God, that you can do it and I can do it as long as you're with me. Teach me. Walk with me. See, that, that's a taking of responsibility. That's a, I have a role to play in this. You have a role to play in you walking out the destiny that God has for you. You have a role to play. So let me tell you, if you're stuck blaming, you are stuck. If you're stuck in bitterness, you are stuck. But if you're ready to forgive and if you're ready to take responsibility, God says, let's go because I'm going to get you there. We're going to walk together in this. I want you to walk with me. You know, that's what repentance is. Repentance is changing your mind about God and changing your mind about you. Did you know that? It, it, repentance is, God, now you are boss, and I am not. God, you have power. I am powerless. God, you love I need to learn how to love. God, this is the way my family's been. But you're the one that's able to break the pattern. And you step out. And you take responsibility because nobody's going to dream your dream for you. You know what's interesting? When I get together with my family, with, a, with my brother and sister, you guys ever do like family reunions? You guys ever do family reunions? Anybody? Anybody get together as relatives? You ever, do you guys like do this where everybody, it doesn't matter how old you are, everyone goes into the same roles that you had when you were growing up? Anybody have it? Right? So I was the pest. Yes, I was. The youngest. I was the brat. My brother was always way too serious. Serious as a heart attack. I never, we just, there was always distance. My sister, my sister and I are really close. I was, I tease her constantly. I teased her when we were growing up. I tease her now. It's a part of the dynamics of our relationship. It's a part of our role. The fact is, is in your family, you've got a role. There's something that you have, you have played out in your life. And people expect you to play that way. But when you come from a, a family that's unhealthy and suddenly you begin to become healthy, suddenly you begin to take responsibility, suddenly you give room for God to work and to break the cycle, suddenly when it's been, hey, don't talk, don't trust, don't feel, and you start talking and telling the truth about what was going on at home, you're not playing by the rules anymore. And the people around you, you will discover, will want you to go back into the role that you had before because they're uncomfortable with the freedom and the grace that you're experiencing. They don't know how to relate to you. And so what happens is, if you don't begin to take responsibility, there will be forces at work that will just pull you back into the roles that you used to be in. And those forces will try to keep you there. But you've got to take responsibility and not let that happen. You've got to say, I know what my destiny is. I know who my God is. 
I know what God wants for my life, and I'm not going to let go, and I'm not going to pretend, and I'm not going to act like everything's okay when it's not okay. Instead, I'm going to speak truth, and I'm going to let God do everything he wants to do in my life. And you've got to do that. Because there are always going to be forces at work that are going to pull you off of your destiny. There are always forces at work that are going to want to make you conform to their diminished expectations of you. And let me tell you something. If you're trying to break addiction, you know this. That, that because of all the failures and all the false starts, that after a while people start looking at you as, no, 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 this is the way you're going to be for the rest of your life. And I'm telling you, you've got to take responsibility. Yes, there's a reason that they think that way, but only you can say, God, help me to see me the way you see me. Help me, God, to dream the dream that you have for me. And you tattoo it on my heart, and you do this with me, because I know that if you're with me, I'm going to get there. Take responsibility. Take that power. Here's the fourth thing. Discover the power of community. I love what he says. He says to God, enlarge my territory, which, by the way, isn't like, give me more land. I just want to be rich, okay? What he's saying is, I don't want to have a small place in the community anymore. God, I don't want people to see me as the pain. I want you to work in my life in a way that my sphere of influence grows. I want people to see my life on display, what you've done in me in spite of my past, in spite of my upbringing. God, I want people to see that. I want you to enlarge my territory. I want to play a part in being able to help bring hope to other people. See, if your dream, if your dream is all about you and your success and your goals, that's a really tiny dream. God is really not interested in that. But if your dream is about what happens, what, what God does in community through you when you're able to tell your story, when your dream is about what you bring to the table because you're able to share what it is that God has done in your life, oh man, I'm telling you, God's all about that. And you've got you, you've to just go, God, you know, you can't do it alone. And here's the other reason why you need community when you're pursuing your dream. Because oftentimes our dreams are so goal-oriented. So goal-oriented that what happens is, 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 is we start losing sense of what's really important, and it's all about the dream, and it's all about achieving my goals. And before you know it, your relationships are going to pot. Because what you don't understand is this, is when God gives you a dream, it is not about you attaining something. It's about the person that you're going to become along the way. And he's going to bring relationships in your life. Some of them are going to disappoint you. Some of them are going to hurt you but you're going to keep loving and you're going to keep trusting because God tattooed your heart with it and that you're not going to give up, but that you're going to embrace doing this in community because you just want to be able to put on display, let God put on display what he's done in you. And that you see that this is a part of something bigger. See, when you look at the Old Testament, God was always about the nation Israel. When you look at the New Testament, God deals individually, but it was always about the church, a community, and what he wants to do is a part of a community because it's where relationships are happening. That's where life change really happens. And you need people in your life that can go, yeah, you're a little bit uh, goal-oriented there, aren't you, buddy? Kind of running over people? Have you lost sight of what really matters? Where's your family fit into it? And you need people in your life that can say, great dream, a little off balance. Let me help you with that. You need people in your life that can say, hey, ooh, man, I think you're, you're getting a little off balance with this whole thing. You know, what, you know what they call that in the business world, by the way, the ability to do that? Emotional intelligence. In the business world, they recognize that there are some CEOs, there are some vice presidents, there are some managers, and they are geniuses. They know what metrics to use. They know what strategies to bring to the market. They know how to boost sales. They know how to make the thing happen. But when it comes to people, they're completely incompetent on knowing how to treat people well. And there are people that go, you're you're a sheer genius, but you have no emotional intelligence. Because you don't see yourself as part of a community. You don't see yourself as bringing people with you. You see yourself as achieving goals at whatever cost. 
And I can tell you this, that when he, Jabez, prayed, God, enlarge my territory, what he's saying is, I don't want to play a small role in community. I want to have a big impact in community. God, I want people to see what you're doing in my life, and I want to encourage people with that. I want to bring something out of this. It's not for me to consume. It's not for me to keep. It's not about my status. It's about helping other people with what you've done. And if that's your dream, God's all in. That's why community is important. That's why, like, small groups we're talking about today. Because it's so important. It's only as you are sharing life with others. It's only as you together are fulfilling the destiny and the calling that is on your life. It's only as you are taking the things that God has done in you, showed you, and you're bringing that. It's only your openness to learn from others that have learned how to walk with God in that area of your life. So, so if, it's, if it's like, I don't even know where to begin. I, the whole Bible is just, I'm confused and I'm making my way back to church or this is my first time. Then starting point is where you start. And there you do the journey together and you let God unfold things together. If, if you're struggling in marriage, learn love languages. Do that with other people. Some have learned it. Others are like, we don't have a clue. We're struggling. It's where I was broke. Now I'm not. Where, where it's like uh, finances. It's so embarrassing to deal with. But I, I just want God to work in this area of my life. Then you've got to do it in community. And I'll tell you why. It's the vehicle that God created for the greatest life transformation to happen. If you think that you can sit down and read a book and listen to tapes and that, wow, you're going to get to your destiny, you're fooling yourself. That's way too small of a dream for God to be a part of. The dream he wants to be a part of is, will you do it with other people? Would you let me speak through them and would you let me speak through you? And would you let me create something beautiful out of that? Would you learn that way? And if you're willing to do that, God's like, I'm all in with you. Listen, if you're going to make your dreams a reality, the dream that God has for you, your destiny, then you're going to do it with other people in community. Enlarge my territory. God, expand my influence. I do not want to play a small role in what you're doing in our community. God, on full display. And it says, the Lord granted him his request. So let's pray. And I'm going to just say this to you as you close your eyes. For some of you, you may have been thinking, yeah, you guys talk about small groups. Yeah, I think I'll do that one day. Yeah, I think that would be a cool thing to do one day. Okay, I've got three words for you. Just do it. Stop wondering. Stop, oh, I think. And just begin to get in on what God wants to do in your life. Move forward. Stop letting your wishes be wishes. Let God begin to make your dreams a reality. Cooperate with Him. And so I can tell you this there's a place for you. There's some place where God is going to do something in your life that is absolutely going to move you to the next place where He wants you. He's going to do something in you. And if you're willing to be wide open with Him, God will move you exactly where He needs you to be. He will put in your heart exactly what you need to know. He will speak to you in ways that you don't expect if you're open. Father, thank you. You are so passionate, so motivated, so determined that when you find someone willing to ask you for something that nobody else believes for them for. You love to grant it. That when somebody's willing to see themselves the way that you see them and believe you, that you are so highly motivated to show up. That when somebody is so willing to make room in their life for you to lead them and to guide them and to go with you, that you love the relationship. Father, I pray right now for business owners, 
who carry the weight of their business like nobody else can even know. For leaders, some leaders of schools, some are managers, some trying to lead in their home, some just trying to raise their kids. And they carry a burden that nobody can even begin to appreciate. Father, I pray, draw them into a space of your presence. Write upon their heart, tattoo something that can never be taken away. And give them strength to continue to press on and to do what it is that you've called them to do, to become who you've created them to become. And Father, for those that, that, that wonder, who are you? God, as they open up their hearts to you, as they place their faith and trust in you, may you come into their lives in such an unexpected and powerful way that they know that they are not the same person, that they know that they have died with you, that they already know that they've been raised again, that there's something they can't explain any other way other than you have made them new. Father, we come against anyone stuck in addiction because they've been defined in the most low expectation by people around them. Father, that those days would be put behind them, that you would open up their heart to your voice, that they could hear the identity that you're writing upon them, and that they could hear you speak words of encouragement. And Lord, that you would reassure them that you are with them, and that when the temptation comes, that the temptation the desire for your voice and your presence so outstrips any other temptation that it becomes easier and easier to say yes to you and no to addiction. Thank you, God, that that's what you do. Lord, we, today we declare your goodness, and we ask that in every group that forms, in every relationship, that you're going to do great things. Expand our boundaries, our territory. Let no one see their place in this community as being insignificant and put on full display your goodness in every life here. God, we thank you for all that. And we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Come on, guys. Let's tell God thank you for his grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. For